about increases in hunting and fishing fees and other game and fish issues. In the meantime, at the Peacock Alley American Bar and Grill, uh, what what is the special tonight, Mr. Gary Emineth? Well, tonight is um, Teeny Tuesday, Martini Tuesday. Buy one, get one free. So as I'm looking down over the crowd, everybody looks like they're drinking martinis because they do make, I think, about 30-some different martinis. And so you want to make sure you got a ride home if you drink over <laughs> one of those, I think, because they're pretty stiff. But they're all fancy, colorful glasses with all different kinds of things in it. So they're known for their martinis, and they do a good job here. Yes, I've, I'm, I'm amazed at the colorfulness of the martinis. It's, um, you know, you see red, white, and blue martinis and, and chocolate martinis, and it's, uh, it's quite uh, – it's a world that I'm not familiar with. I'm basically, you know, pour some scotch in a glass and I'm good, or <laughs> a beer into a – a glass well, and I'm fine. I'm not too much into exotics. Yeah, I might have a beer or wine, but I but I, I did have one last week. Remember when I, we were doing this and I had the 707, the James Bond one, whatever. But it was 007. A dirty, 007. Double oh, yeah, double oh, seven. Seven oh seven. Seven oh seven. <laughs> yeah, I fly too much in too many airplanes. You know, <laughs> seven forty seven. It's funny I didn't say that, but but anyway, um, they um, they're, they're known for the martinis on Tuesday nights and they pack the place out. So we're going to get a little noise in the background because people are going to have way too much fun down there, I'm afraid, Dale. <laughs> All so, right. Well, as so, long as they don't drive and that, that's everything's good. So how was the day at the legislature, Dale? You had a busy day before we go to our guest. Is there a lot of happening up there? Or? Well, there's uh, a number of things. One of them is the uh, there's another version of uh, a bill that uh, increases penalties for driving under the influence. And it's uh, fairly well good to go to a probably to a House Senate conference committee the, the big features of it is are that if a drunken driver kills someone, there's a new, there's a new crime established of criminal vehicular homicide. It's a Class A felony with a minimum sentence of three years in prison. And if it's a second offense, you, you get at least 10 years in prison. Now, normally a Class A felony is 20 years in prison. That's the maximum. But here we have a crime. Is if, you're a, uh, if, if you're under the influence, you have an accident, you kill someone, you can, you're going to go to prison for at least three years. If you cause a serious injury, uh, you've committed a Class C felony, you'd get a minimum sentence of at least one year in prison and two years in prison for a second offense. And your second, if you have a habit of driving under the influence while you're with one of your children or, or more than one, uh, that is also a Class C felony on your second offense instead of a Class A misdemeanor. And, and a, again, a Class C felony is five years in prison and a five thousand dollar fine that's the the maximum and some of these uh, penalties have uh, some of these offenses have a uh, minimum sentences so we'll see how well that does in the north dakota house this is a a, a new version of the of the uh, dui bill that uh, has been written in the north dakota senate will uh, end up in a conference committee where the house and senate will work out what they think is mutually agreeable and then try to uh to pass it uh, there was a conference committee this morning, a rather short one, on uh, the last abortion bill of the legislature. Uh, what it does is it uh, bans most abortions at 20 weeks. Now, we have already have a, a bill that has been passed and signed by the governor that bans most abortions at six weeks. So you wonder what is the point of this one. And uh, we'll be discussing that, actually, uh, later on uh, in the show after we uh, talk about game and fish issues. Uh, the, the controversial part of this, the particularly uh, controversial part of it, was that it banned state and federal money from being used for contracts with entities that do abortions or promote abortion rights or refer uh, clients for abortions. Now, this was problematic because it could prevent the state from contracting with the Sanford Health Organization for Medicaid services because, according to the chairman of the House Human Services Committee, uh, Sanford does do emergency abortions. And so if because of that, they would be shut out of the state's Medicaid program. And that didn't work very well. And so what happened in the, uh, in the uh, conference committee meeting this morning, they met for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and said we've got to take this language out that, that closes off uh, a, num a, med a major medical provider from federal funds. And, and then the, that was agreed to, and the conference uh, committee ended. And now this bill will go back to the House for additional review. Now, this bill doesn't have any criminal penalties for illegal abortions. Originally, it said a doctor who did an abortion on a fetus older than 20 weeks could be charged with a felony, uh, five years in prison, and a $5,000 fine. It also said the woman and the child, unborn child's father could sue 
the doctor for uh, damages. Uh, there was one other hearing of note. It, uh, it, uh, it's about a bill that uh, creates a new duty to report a missing child. If you uh, are, don't report a missing child and you're that child's caretaker and the child is younger than 13 and you don't know where this child is for at least 24 hours and you don't report it to the authorities, you could be charged with a felony crime. And if the kid is 13 to 17 years old if, and is missing for 48 hours or more, and you willfully or negligently, this is the language in the law, fail to report that that person is missing, you're going to be guilty of a, a Class B misdemeanor, which is 30 days in jail. Also, the failure to report the death of a child within two hours and the location of the body uh, is a Class C felony if you don't report it within two hours. This was inspired by, uh, if that's the word, by the case of Kaylee Anthony in Florida. She's a two-year-old girl. She was reported missing after she'd been missing for about 30 days. Uh, she was reported missing by her, uh, her grandmother. Her, eventually, uh, Kaylee Anthony's mother was put on trial for murder and acquitted. Her mother's name was uh, Casey, Anson, Casey Anthony. She was uh, acquitted of murder and child abuse. She was convicted of some misdemeanors for giving uh, false statements to police. We'd like to turn now to our guest, Mr. Terry Steinwand, who is the director of the State Game and Fish Department, and Representative Dick Anderson, who is a Republican from Willow City. Uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Uh, good evening, Dale. Thanks for having both of us here. Well, Hi, thank, Dale. Thank you, sir. Glad to and be here. I'm, I'm glad to have you. And first of all, we one of the major things uh, in the legislature this year, as far as the Game and Fish Department is concerned, is an increase in hunting and fishing fees. And Mr. Steinwan, could you explain uh, what's going on here and why these fee increases are necessary? Sure, no problem, Dale. Uh, I, I guess I just want to mention before I even start on that that uh, Representative Anderson is, is very well versed in game and fish activity because he's a former game and fish advisory board member and actually would still be on if, if he hadn't been elected to the legislature. He resigned, unfortunately, when he, when he came on the legislature. But uh, leading into the license fees, we are a special fund agency, meaning we, we receive no general funds, and, and we actually like it that way. Uh, it's, it's a true example of user pay. Our funding source comes from hunting and fishing license sales, and then federal excise taxes. It's called Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Funds. It's excise taxes on hunting and fishing equipment, ammunition, gun sales, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and right now, uh, the, the fund is pretty flush with the gun sales. But... Uh, there's a law on the books that says if we go below $15 million in our general fund balance at any time within Game and Fish, that we have to go to the budget section for approval to spend even a penny below $15 million. And uh, our projections were by July of 2015, without any uh, additional source of income, we would be at about $15.5 million in that fund balance. Uh, we actually did not ask for this, uh, any license fee increases to come in, but during our fall advisory board meetings in November of 2012 across the state, a number of sportsmen and women came to those meetings and said, are you going to ask for some? If we, we said we, we would really like them. We really need them to get that fund balance restored, but it would be better if you'd ask them. So subsequently, a lot of the sporting groups around the state came to the legislature and said, would you put something together? And there are actually two different bills. It was House Bill 1130 on the House side and Senate Bill 2231, which ultimately is the one that passed. And uh, our, our best guess, based on historical license sales, it will mean about an additional $5.5 million per year into our fund balance. But we consider it's probably going to take about nine years to get up in that 25 to $27 million range, even with this. And and we do know that there's going to be some losses, license sales. National statistics tell us that any time you have a license fee increase, some people drop out, uh, and then they ultimately do come back. But there's that short-term loss. So uh, there's a real delicate balance that has to be done there. And the legislature did a wonderful job, I think, uh, on providing that balance. Uh, why did the... Uh, why did your fund balance decline? Uh, a large portion of it is uh, a number of reasons, actually. The primary reason being interest rates uh, are just in the tank. We used to get about $2 million of biennium in interest. We're down to about $250,000 uh, of biennium, actually, in interest. Uh, the three hard winners of, of uh, 9, 10, and 11, or 8, 9, and 10, I, I'm sorry, 
uh, really took a toll on our deer herd, and that is a primary source of income for us. Uh, we went from 100, approximately 150,000 available licenses down to 65,000 last year. That is about a $900,000 a year hit. In association with that, our PLOTS program, Private Land Open to Sportsmen, uh, it spends about four to four and a half million dollars a year renting land from, from landowners out there for public access and wildlife production. And that fund wasn't keeping up. Uh, there's only so much we can put into that. So we were actually spending into our fund balance as a result of, those, of that factor. And of course, reduced revenue because of reduced interest rates and uh, loss of license revenue from deer sales. Uh, Representative Anderson, uh, one of the things that I thought was extraordinary about the hearings on these fee bills is all of the sportsmen's groups that came in and said, please make us, please, we want to pay more. We want higher fees. Uh, how, how extraordinary is that? Uh, well, I think the sportsmen like to hunt and the fishermen like to fish, and they saw a need for the budget increase. And in our testimony, I don't remember one negative comment on the hunting fees in fact a lot of them wish we would double it or whatever it needed so they would have opportunities to hunt and fish and uh, you know you need two things to hunt you need habitat and you need access with the crp disappearing the plots program is even going to be more important than it is now and uh, uh numerous people go out hunting and the most expensive part of their hunt is the gas driving to and from their hunting spot, if you have more plots land available and, and maybe they can s save 20, 30 miles driving out to hunt, it's going to more than cover the increase in the hunting license. So I I have no problems, and I don't think any of the sportsmen have problems with the, the license fee increases. Mr. Steinwan, was it surprising to have folks kind of flocking in and saying, please raise my fees? No, it really wasn't, because that's what we have been hearing. Uh, I, I guess we were a little surprised. I can't speak for Representative Anderson, but we were a little surprised that there was absolutely zero opposition to these bills. Uh, what, one thing we did when we talked on the House side and the Senate side is we certainly have regional averages for hunting and fishing licenses. We didn't want to outprice people from going out there and enjoying that, that recreational resource. So one thing we requested is when they look at that, let's keep it within that average. And they did, they did a good job of that. We are either at or below the regional average for hunting and fishing. And, and just using as an example of people are saying, well, gee, good Lord, I don't want to spend that much money. Uh, it's going it's, it's to cost me too much. Just as an example, if you like to hunt pheasants, uh, if you like to hunt ducks and geese, if you like to fish, you like to hunt coyotes, and if you're fortunate enough to get a deer license, with Senate Bill 2231, which is going to the governor's desk tomorrow, I believe, it will cost you an additional $28 a year to do all of that. And again, to put it in perspective, the current gas prices in Bismarck, that's seven and a half gallons of gas. If you go down to a sporting goods store, maybe you'll get a box of high-power rifle shells for $28. So, it, it, uh, like Representative Anderson said, you, you have to put it in perspective. If we can get some plots lands closer to the communities out there, they're going to more than save that and still be able to enjoy what North Dakota has to offer. How much plots land do you have, and how is it being able to offset the loss in conservation reserve program land? Well, actually, a lot of we we had we had about 400,000 acres of, of conservation reserve or CRP in our plots program. Of course, as that's going out, that's dropping too. Actually right now, I hate to even give the number on air because it is low, but it's typically low this time of the year. And this is in the time that, that uh, the sportsmen and women care about it. It's come around August, September when hunting seasons start is when we care. We have a million acre goal and uh, we're probably going to try to increase that a little bit. Uh, we still have to live and still have to spend within our appropriations budget given to us by the legislature. So having these license fee increases doesn't mean we're going to have 2 million acres of plots out there. Rental rates are going up. Uh, operating costs are going up. So it's a little bit of everything. But we still have the million acre goal. We've had that since 1999. We met it in 2007. It's dropped off a little bit, but we're going to try to build that back up. One of the things I was wondering about is that with commodity prices as strong as they are and beef prices, et cetera, I imagine that you're going to have to pay more for, for the privilege of, of having folks hunt on private land. Absolutely. And that's one thing we took into consideration. How long commodity prices are going to stay high, I, you know, we don't know. Uh, land prices, 
what we do know, our rental rates are going to go up, and we're going to have to pay more for the equivalent amount of land that we have now. Yeah, corn's dropped about $2 in the last week and a half, so yeah. commodity prices are going down. Okay. What, what, what was the reason for that, do you think? Well, the USDA came out with a report saying that there's more grain around than they thought there was, and whether or not you believe that, the, the, the market does. Okay. Um, how do you try to attract folks to hunting and fishing? Uh, I think Representative Anderson said it well. Uh, if you have the habitat, which equals wildlife, and you have the access associated with that, that's going to draw people in. We don't advertise. We don't market. We're kind of the field of dreams. Uh, build it and they will come. Uh, with the Internet, with uh, these blogs out there, if, if fishing's good, people know it. And fishing has been tremendous the last year. Uh, hunting was really good last fall. People know it almost immediately. And, and they'll come in, and with the ease of, of Internet licensing, they say, oh, I'm not going to buy a license. Well, Joe comes over and said, hey, geez, I just had a great day of pheasant hunting out here. I'm going to go online, buy a pheasant license, go out. It, it, doesn't, it costs you the same for a license if you go out one day or 100 days. You know, that, that's, that's the beauty of it. Dale, one other thing, too. The last few years have been extremely wet, and I think at one time we may have had like 180, 90 fishing lakes, and I think now the number's close to 400. So there's a lot more opportunities for people to fish anyway. Yeah, you're right, Representative Anderson. A lot more opportunity, but again, the challenge and the cost is more, too, because we have to we have to provide fish for those lakes in a lot of instances where we don't get natural reproduction so the cost for hatchery production and distribution costs subsequently go up too so this is where this license fee increase is going to help also is hunting and fishing becoming more or less popular amongst the general public i i'd say it's either equal or more to to what it has been uh we did an economic and expenditure study uh we hadn't done one for about 10 years it's the, the gross business volume in North Dakota is about $1.4 billion industry. Uh, direct expenditure is about $650 million for hunting and fishing. Uh, about 70% of that is actually fishing. Uh, the beauty of that is there's $40 million of state and local taxes uh, actually generated as a result of that hunting and fishing activity and right about 2,500 to 3,000 jobs. How does, how does our out-of-state... Or vis- how how's our number of visiting hunters stack up to what it was, say, for example, five years ago? It, it's actually increased a little bit. Uh, our we were concerned last year that we weren't going to we weren't going to see the non-residents coming in, uh, and there's certainly a source of income for it also. But they they still came. We actually had I won't say record, but higher than 2011 license sales for non-residents. What attracts uh, non-residents mostly? Is it ducks, uh, pheasants? Uh, it. Ducks and pheasants is a primary, yes. Okay. We also have some non-residents that come here and make a living off of trapping during the winter. And there was some questions about the fees for non-resident trapping during the testimony. But uh, I understand one guy had caught 10,000 muskrat. He sold them for $11.14. So there was some money in trapping. Yeah, yeah, there, and, and, and as Representative Anderson mentioned earlier, that is a result of the wet conditions we've had primarily in the eastern third of the state for the, the last few years, and muskrat population has really exploded. And if they were $2 a piece, they wouldn't be a contentious issue, but being 10 or $11 a piece, it, it gets to be a guarded resource. One of the bills that you mentioned, uh, 1130, it... it, 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 it requires the implementation of a computerized online licensing system. Can you, can you talk about how that will work? Well, actually, it started out as a license fee bill, and it was yeah. hog-housed in committee, yes. uh, gosh, last Friday, I believe it was. Actually, what it is, is uh, at the beginning of the session, we were requested to provide information of what it would take to implement totally an online licensing system. Uh, it, we provided that information, and nothing happened until just last week. So, and actually what it would do, it would, it would mandate county auditors who are in charge of determining who in their county actually sells license. They call them agents, we call them vendors, uh, small businesses out there. It would mandate every county auditor to be on the online licensing system by 2015 and then all the vendors by 2016. It sounds relatively simple and if you go online and buy your game and fish or a hunting and fishing license online, it's relatively easy, but it's not the same system as a vendor would have. It looks the same as you look at it on the screen, 
uh, we've actually been sending out information to county auditors because we didn't know exactly what the bill was going to look like, and we, we forewarned them this was coming, and they embraced it, but we didn't think they understood what it actually was, and we weren't sure what it actually was at that point in time either. But uh, we're sending out information again there. saying, if you don't like this bill, it's up to you to contact your senators on, on this particular one, because it is on the Senate side. And if it does pass, it will, it will have to go to the House for concurrence and then probably conference committee. I think there's 19 counties that currently... 20. 20 that yeah. sell license. Yeah, they're, they are online already, so it means there's 33 county auditors or counties out there that are not on the online license. Do they have any problem with getting on it? Uh, some some probably would. Some probably would. They the way the bill reads, actually, the original language, they they are the ones that that can select who they want as a licensing agent out there. That licensing agent then has to provide a bond because the county auditor is responsible for all the fees collected. And then they get them to us. We pay out to the county auditor what the law says we have to pay out per license sold. Uh, it, it is a little bit more of a, of a responsibility, but in terms of from us, uh, it's about 54 cents a license we spend if you go electronic, and it's about a dollar four if it's a paper license. So it is a cost savings. How has oil development affected hunting in western North Dakota? Uh, it, it certainly has. It's affected uh, hunting. It's affected uh, traffic. I, I think the pace has a, uh, affected it more than anything. It's happened so fast. Uh, there's no doubt there's going to be impact on fish and wildlife populations. You increase traffic. Uh, you, there, the imprint or the, the footprint of the well itself, which I think is minor, I honestly believe the traffic and the population growth is probably the, the, the biggest factor. But I know they're just rushing to get pipelines in, which is going to reduce the impact. Uh, we're scrambling trying to figure out what, what amount of the people, the influx of the public, into that northwest part of the state actually hunting and fishing because there might be a higher demand on that resource than we currently have also. We've been listening to uh, Mr. Terry Steinwand. He is the director of the North Dakota Game and Fish Department, and also we've had with us uh, Representative Dick Anderson, a Republican from Willow City and a former member of the North Dakota Game and Fish Department Advisory Board. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dale. Th thanks, Dale. Uh, prohibit most abortions uh, beyond the 20th week of pregnancy, uh, which is it's, it's often referred to as the fetal pain bill in the the logic of the 20-week uh, deadline or, or, or threshold is that at that point the unborn child can feel pain in the, the woman's uh, womb. But what the disagreement was about in the conference committee was about something entirely different. And, well, maybe not entirely different, but it was not, it did not have anything to do with 20-week uh, 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 abortion. Uh, Senator Barry, uh, could you explain to us, please, what were the points of difference in the conference committee about uh, what, what was what was the bone of contention in the conference committee? Well, again, uh, and thank you for having us tonight. Uh, as it relates to uh, the conference committees in general, basically this was a Senate bill, so it started on the, on the Senate side. The bill was passed. The House then took a look at it, and through the pro their process, they, they added some amendments to the bill that we had passed. So in conference committee, when we start, you st we start with the bill that the Senate had passed, that the first chamber passed, and then we, we addressed the amendments. That's what we're limited to and focused on, is simply the amendments uh, that were added. Basically, those amendments uh, had to do with a couple of things. Funding would be probably the uh, one of the biggest issues. Our current code already has in it uh, statements such that uh, they we do not uh, allow for public funds, any uh, public funds or state funds or any federal funds that pass through the state to be used to uh, in the performance of abortion. And uh, so this is already in code, but amendments that were added, added uh, to that, talking about contracting, it mentioned specifically, and I'm just looking for the, uh, uh, for the spot here, they, they, they mentioned, yeah, specifically the idea of, uh, contracting with or providing financial support to other individuals or organizations or entities that do counsel or favor abortion. So again, I think that was the language that probably got a lot of people excited because it had to do with, uh, they were felt to be unintended consequences as it, helped, as it was uh, to do with tentacles, if you will, uh, of state monies and how that would be involved with such institutions such as uh, Sanford Health in Fargo. 
there were some concerns as it w as regard to Medicaid payments and uh, the possibility thereof. Now, again, a lot of this hadn't been totally settled, but those were the concerns. And so basically this created a little bit of a, a firestorm as it related to the possibility of these things occurring. And so that's why the conference committee was called. We wanted to discuss these matters, uh, come to a conclusion, and we did. And how did this uh, come out, Mr. Silvernagle? I think um, after the uh, House passed the bill uh, a week or two ago, uh, as, as usual, bills get more attention, more focus. And I think the Human Services uh, Department looked at it more closely as it relates specifically to uh, health care providers and, and Medicare, Medicaid. And uh, I think the concerns were that uh, uh, some of the medical providers do uh, perform emergency abortions. And uh, just how might that all uh, interact with the approval process and what may or may not be approved? And was, was essentially the risk here that uh, with the language in the bill that was put in by the House that you could have situations where hospitals, like for example, Sanford Health, could not get reimbursed for any Medicaid patient because they might have done an emergency abortion? Well, see, and that, that was something that was, again, not anywhere near the intent of the bill. And so the conference committee, and very quickly, this was determined that if the amendments were going to cause any problems, any possibility of unintended consequence that did not have to do with the focus and purpose of the intent of the bill, that we wanted those out of there. And so that's why the, the, the conference committee actually took less than 15 minutes uh, to come to a conclusion. It was a unanimous conclusion to remove the amendments, to return to the bill the way it uh, initially had passed out of the Senate, uh, as that had to it the intent of what this fetal pain bill was all about. This removes any possibility or any thoughts of anybody thinking that there's going to be a restriction as it has to do with Medicaid or a restriction as it has to do with any grants that might help with research for any uh, chronic disease states or a lot of the uh, things that have been circulated in the media most recently. This, uh, this is absolutely gone. There's not a chance for that that wasn't intended, and now we don't have to think about it. And, and I think, uh, Senator Barry, uh, as you indicated, the intent of the amendments were to clarify and to uh, uh, streamline, if you will. And uh, I think uh, uh, as human services brought these new uh, issues to light, uh, uh, they needed to be dealt with. So what happens to the bill now? Well, basically, at this point, obviously any bill to become law has to pass both chambers in the same form. And this bill has passed the Senate in the form that it's in right now. And therefore, the Senate will, will uh, this does not need to be voted on again in the Senate. The House will take this back, and ultimately at some point, they'll have to uh, discuss this now amongst uh, uh, some of the uh, Human Service uh, Committee folks. And then at some point, ultimately, the House will be taking a vote uh, on this version of the bill that, that the conference committee accepted. And then uh, from there, if in fact that is passed, then ultimately at some point it would uh, reach the, uh, the governor's desk. Representative Silvernagel, do you see, foresee any problem with this bill without its amendments being passed by the House? Um, I, I don't at this time. Uh, I would expect uh, that it would pass. There's uh, uh, good provisions in this bill. Uh, specifically, uh, this bill does uh, clarify some uh, uh, definitions uh, in code. Uh, and it also clarifies uh, some of the reporting requirements on an ongoing basis. And uh, uh, I uh, would expect it would pass. Dr. Berry, uh, this is often described as the fetal pain bill. Can you describe why it acquired that uh, description? Uh, certainly. There's legislation in many states now throughout the, the nation. Uh, as recent research, uh, obviously the more we learn uh, about life's developments from the earliest stages on going forward there's a growing uh, amount I would say it's actually at critical mass the evidence for the ability for a fetus an unborn child at around the 20 week gestation mark to be able to sensate pain and therefore that's where you get the term fetal pain bill is that if the if the uh, preborn child the unborn child is able to feel pain the, the concept of this is to protect 
the life of that child from the time that the child can feel pain. That is the purpose of this, because obviously that procedure uh, of an abortion at that point would be quite horrific. How do we know whether a fetus can feel pain? Well, a lot of that will be is determined through uh, there are certain stimuli that we use. Uh, we use this throughout life continuum. We have many pa- in, when patients per se are unconscious. There there are many things that we will use clinical indicators that we can test those unconscious patients and based on their reactions we can determine whether they're sensating pain and they can do a lot of these things uh, based on on their uh, the stimuli that they're able to give the unborn child when it's in the uterus and based on the reactions and studying those they can make those determinations this bill is this bill i'll just put it this way is this bill necessary given the bills that the governor has already signed yes uh, absolutely the when you look at the the varying, as I said, there's this growing amount of evidence that is out there. Uh, the bills that are passed, these are in different sections, as Representative Silbernagel pointed out. These are in different sections of codes, and obviously each section of code, each title has its own definitions, and therefore uh, when you put these into place in their sections with their definitions, uh, they, they absolutely, each one is very significant. I was just wondering, because the governor has already signed... Uh, what everyone calls the heartbeat bill, uh, which essentially prohibits most abortions after six weeks. And now this bill prohibits most abortions after 20 weeks. And I was wondering, why do you need both of those? And again, I I think, uh, uh, Dale, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are other pieces to the bill. Uh, It spells out some definitions more clearly in code. And uh, and, and this is intended to uh, clarify some language, and it's also intended to clarify some of the reporting requirements as to when are abor- when are abortions performed, at what age uh, of, of the post fertilization age, and I think that's intended to be in the bill. I was just wondering, uh, is it going to be difficult to mesh these when, if they're say, if they're both passed, they're both signed by the governor, they're both put into the state statute book. Is it going to be confusing to interpret if you have one law that says 20 weeks, another one that says six, and you're trying to figure out how these two laws work together? Well, basically, in talking with the, the, the uh, legislative council, the individuals who deal with the drafting of the bills, there is not a conflict based on where they are in code and how they're written. Uh, specifically, when these were drafted, those provisions were looked at so that there wouldn't be a conflict. As I said, it all, it all depends on where uh, the different, uh, where in the code the statute appears. And so there, there's not to be a conflict the way these are written. They're put in, as uh, Representative Sib- Silbernager said, for, to allow us to look at definitions. Uh, each one has their purpose, uh, which the courts will then be able to rely on and make determinations from. I'd like to know also, uh, Senator Berry and Representative Silbernager, what reaction you've heard and gotten from the previous, not only this bill, but the previous bills that the legislature has approved and the governor has signed that restrict uh, abortion. I mean, the debate's been quite passionate, and I wondered what sort of uh, reaction you both have heard. Sure. Uh, We've uh, received a lot of response uh, from both sides of the aisle, and uh, uh, I would say that uh, those that support these bills think this is a great day for unborn children and a great day for North Dakota. And uh, I haven't specifically been counting those for and those against, but uh, we've received uh, many, many positive uh, uh, responses, uh, and certainly we received some from the other side of the aisle as well. Senator Barry, what kind of responses have you gotten? Well, in, in a very similar fashion. As we mentioned, I think previously when we touched on this subject, it obviously is a very passionate subject. There are individuals that feel very strongly along a continuum. And just as Representative Silbernagel said, I certainly have received many, many uh, responses in, uh, in favor and uh, as it relates to unborn, the unborn in this uh, state and the development of a culture of life, which we're trying to enhance uh, here in North Dakota and really across the country. A uh, lot of folks, uh, literally not only from this state, but from across the country and that are in tremendous support of what we're doing here in North Dakota to champion life. Now, have we heard uh, from the other, uh, from folks that disagree with our uh, opinions? Absolutely. Those folks have voiced theirs too. And certainly I, I want to state, I absolutely respect that each individual has to come to this in their own, with their own uh, views, their own conscience, and they make those determinations. Because basically we're talking about human life and 
and that's, a, that's obviously a very core issue to all of us, and it's something that we each need to uh, be comfortable with. What sort of reputation do you think the state will get as a result of all the publicity about these bills? This is something I think, it, rather than going backwards, sometimes some pe- folks will refer to and say, boy, you're, you're, you're moving North Dakota backwards. We're moving backwards in time. Quite the opposite. This is absolutely an acknowledgment of moving forward. This is what we've learned. When you look from the earliest days of the initial uh, Roe v. Wade uh, decision in 1973, when you look at, at uh, what the court had looked at at that time and saying that, gosh, there's a lot we don't know. They admitted there's a lot we don't know, and they gave future courts and future uh, jurisdictions things to look at and, and things to weigh. And one of those things was the development as we learn about the early origins in life and, and some of the wonderful things that we're able to do, such as in vitro fertilization, which has brought life uh, where it wasn't previously able, which is a wonderful thing. Those things couldn't have even been dreamed of back then. But now, as we learn that and start to apply what we're learning to life and what the court said was very important, potential life, not just life, but potential life and the value of that, this actually is very forward-looking as to how the court may interpret these things. And then, Dale, I I think... um uh, as we've received uh, responses, uh, we've received responses from around the country and uh, folks that are saying uh, it's terrific, uh, the work that's being done by this legislature in regards to life. And, uh, and it can start and happen in North Dakota and hopefully grow from there. There is a, as you know, a constitutional amendment that's going to be on the ballot next uh, November, November of 2014, that, uh, that makes the declaration that the state of North Dakota is obliged to protect life at all stages of development. Where does that fit in and how is that how is that going to affect uh, anti-abortion legislation in North Dakota or any other type of legislation? Well again that's a very separate topic all of its own. Uh, uh, the concurrent resolution that you mentioned that's going to be on the ballot talks about uh, uh, life at all stages of development as you mentioned. That is very separate from what we've just been discussing. This, that's a whole separate uh, issue that, will, that the voters of the state will be looking to put into the Constitution as it relates to do we, as a, as a state, are we going to recognize uh, life at every stage of development and uh, we talk about the dignity thereof. So again, as it relates to life, and that's the way I like to refer to these bills, we're talking about life, and that's something that we're going to be... Uh, be deciding on here in a roughly a year and a half as to how this state wants to view that. I was just wondering if this amendment uh, buttresses these bills or affects them at all? or, or Well, I, I think, Dale, uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, if the bills, if the election is held and the measure passes, I think it buttresses, it strengthens, and it also gives the people of North Dakota a chance to speak. And uh, the conversation's been going on for about 40 years now, and uh, this truly gives the the, the people a chance to uh, say uh, how they feel. And I'm confident in the people of North Dakota that uh, they will support and and, and reinforce what this legislature's doing. What do you think this is going to make the next election like? As it relates to? Uh, I mean, how do you... You're going to have a lot of people running for the legislature in 2014. And this is, you know, many of them are going to have voted on these bills. Do you think that abortion is going to be the biggest issue that we talk about uh, in the next election? Well, it's always tough to predict a year and a half from now what exactly will and won't be the, the lead uh, issues of the time. Certainly life is always a big issue. And for, for a lot of legislators, it's a very primary issue. And so how, you know, how North Dakotans view life, how the legislators view life, and how the North Dakotans view their legislators' view on life is going to be important. And so certainly, as it relates, because there are many things on the ballot uh, that that regard life, yes, the turnout will be impacted by that. And uh, as it relates to legislators uh, and and their votes, as you're mentioning, the the, the political aspects as opposed to the policy, uh, well, we'll have to just wait and see how that goes. I was just wondering to what extent this affected either of your gentlemen's uh, last elections? Did, was this a subject that people talked about? Was it foremost in their minds? I, I would say uh, uh, in many cases people would ask uh, how I felt about uh, abortion, unborn children, pro-life. Uh, absolutely they were asking then. 
and I expect they'll be asking uh, between uh, now and uh, the next election. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively new at this, Dale, and uh, uh, I, I feel uh, that as we go forward into the months ahead, uh, absolutely. But, you know, uh, when you vote, people know how you feel. So uh, I think that speaks louder than the words. One of the things that I thought was interesting about the debate is that there were a number of folks, and these were people who opposed the bills, uh, who said these bills are obviously unconstitutional. The legislature shouldn't be passing them because they're unconstitutional. And we're going to be spending a lot of money on legal fees that we could be spending on something else. And these legislators, and this comment was also made about the, the governor who signed these bills, these legislators are violating their oath of, oath of office because they're, they're sworn to uphold the Constitution, and this is against the Constitution, and therefore you're violating your oath of office. I, I wanted to know what you thought about arguments like that. Well, legislator, legislatures meet across the country, uh, literally on a yearly basis, the state legislators meet. Obviously, our federal legislature is in session a good part of the year. Bills are passed into law in a variety of different topics that end up needing to be determined in the courts as to their constitutionality. The Supreme Court deals with everything from, well, recently this week, most folks are familiar with the, uh, the uh, Defense of Marriage Act. There are also issues they deal with with eminent domain. Uh, so they obviously deal with life issues uh, as it relates to the one specifically that you just mentioned, uh, partial birth abortion, was upheld by the Supreme Court until it wasn't. Okay, In 07, when it was turned over, it had already been upheld previously. There's been decisions by the uh, Supreme Court at one stage. Uh, at, at, uh, there was a time prior to the Civil War when black-skinned individuals weren't felt to be persons. Well, that obviously isn't true anymore. So as it relates to the courts and how they view things, depending on the development of the society, the culture, in this case the science and technology and the medical information that's necessary and that's there, when they have not taken a good fresh look at all of this for roughly 40 years. And do you think that uh, this will enhance the ability of these bills to be upheld if you have, if the state of medical science can determine uh, much, if the state of medical science in terms of, of whether a fetus is capable of feeling pain, for example? I mean, that I presume that was not available in 1973, but it's available now? Precisely. The, the level of uh, information that is available now that wasn't then is just, it's truly amazing. Not just the fetal pain, but just the, the concept that when there's a, a viable heartbeat, when, we, when we're able to see a, and detect a heartbeat, nearly 100% of those pregnancies will go on to term and deliver. And so when the issue of viability comes up, this term of viability that you hear all the time, there's going to be a redefinition of that, of looking at what is viability. When you look at it from the standpoint of once we, we see this physiologic uh, marker present, we're looking at, some, at, at life that goes on to uh, continue throughout its continuum unless something halts it. And that's very important. So all of that information that we're learning absolutely buttresses things. Is this the significance of the, um, the fetal, fetal heartbeat is a powerful frankly a powerful symbol you know you have a beating mm -hmm. heart but is there actually a relationship as you mentioned between uh the detection of a fetal heartbeat and whether or not the pregnancy will be successful yes that's exactly what that's just what i was referencing okay. representative silbernagel um how do you think this will how do you think this will affect the, the abortion clinic in Fargo? I mean, is the, is the goal here, I'd like to ask this of both of you, is the goal here to, to uh, shut it down? Well, I think uh, the intent is to uh, limit and to restrict uh, uh, unnecessary abortions uh, uh, to, if you will, uh, 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 be more focused and bring more clarity on which abortions can be performed and primarily when in the case of medical emergency. Uh, as far as the sponsors of the bill and their intent, I can't speak to that. But as I view this, it is really to limit uh, abortions that are performed and, uh, and to bring clarity on, uh, on our century code on, on what that means. Well, again, the particular bills that have gone through now, these are not aimed at anyone or anything. This is about life. This is about setting good public policy in the state of North Dakota as it relates to our view on life. 
Now, currently, there's an ab abortion provider in the uh, city of uh, Fargo, but there's been some in Jamestown, there's been some in Grand Forks. Who knows whether one will open up in Bismarck or Williston. The goal is that the courts have told us that the states have a compelling uh, interest in regulating and controlling the procedure for the unborn and for the woman. And that is what we're trying to do, is put in place good public policy for now and going forward as it relates to that matter. Thank you for your time. Uh, this is You've been listening to Senator Spencer Berry. He's a, a Republican from Fargo and Representative Peter Silvernagel, a Republican from Castleton. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. <laughs>